last time we covered uh, the scenario of uh, static web content and media. Uh, so this is a new way of doing things in cloud. So I am hoping that you guys are aware of that because um, serving through uh, the storage idea that any object that is stored on cloud has a URL is a very different idea than a regular way of uh, uh, doing. And we need to be aware of the properties, the access issues uh, in, in this uh, new way of doing things, right? Because cloud storage is used a lot. And uh, one of the options of storage is this uh, URL-based object storage, right? So how do we um, take care of these things? So for example, we said that uh, in this um, static storage solution, we will have uh, these objects in the containers, right? So I want to serve these, this page, which has the CSS, this JavaScript, some HTML also. I will put them in a in a uh, container and pull serve those through the request link, right? But uh, how do I ensure that uh, which is, it's only my page, which is requesting this content, not some random client, right? Um, because if this application is, uh, you know, displayed on the, on the browser, I can go and check what link it is pointing to, right? And use that, copy that link, write my own application and use that link to get the data. Let's say these are the images that, uh, uh, I have so painstakingly taken by, and I have copyrights on them. And then I, because they are images and uh, I taught you that it is uh, good for, good candidate for storage based uh, web website, static content. So you implement that. These images are taken by you. But the default, I mean, uh, the URL will just fetch the image, right? So somebody can copy the URL in, in his or her application and fetch the images. You will have no idea and people will start using your assets. So much so that sometimes actually uh, in, it has happened in the past that companies store, use the S3 bucket, Amazon S3 bucket to store the information of the data. And S3 bucket by default is a public bucket. So when you put something there, if somebody knows the URL, they can access it. So much of the information that some companies are putting on S3 bucket was accessible publicly, even though that information was meant only for some specific set of people in the company. So you, these things you should know because obviously that kind of solution was also implemented by some dev who listened to or learned that there is an S3 storage bucket but did not go deep into understanding the use case and how to handle it properly. And he or she just implemented one storage uh, created a uh, Amazon storage and everybody in that product team started developing against that storage URL and then putting the data there. They put the application on live and then they found that there's a huge vulnerability over there. All of the data of the company storing in that storage location um, is getting, is publicly exposed. Anybody can look at it given the URL. And it's not difficult to guess the URLs because somewhere down in the pages, the URL will be available, right? In this application page, the um, web page, HTML page is going to come to the client. So client can simply inspect the HTML and check what URL the elements are pointing to. So it's not difficult to get the URLs to the S3 bucket. And so you can understand why this is important is because this is a new concept, but the vulnerabilities, the issues with new concepts are not new. They need to, you need to be very careful about it, right? For example, implementing a token-based access. So, um, 
uh, we probably may not cover everything in detail in our course about these things, but uh, be aware that in Amazon S3, the default access is public, and you should make sure that it is not public if it is not meant to be public. So you should change the setting or something like that. Okay, so you need to be careful about the new ideas that we talk about here. Um, another new work, new idea is that there is there are no way to query the data that you put in the storage, at least in the blob storage and S3 buckets, right? So you need to be aware of that also. Now, uh, if I want to, let's say I have like huge images library, right? So obviously I will upload the images in the storage bucket in the uh, in the storage this blob storage or or S3, right? But um, oh, I want to use those images, right? For example, let's say this is it is a website which you can you where you can search for images. Okay, you can search for images by some keyword like nature and then you can put more like uh, oceans or sea, sea life and the relevant images will show up as thumbnails you can click on that image and then it will download the proper image right so all this is static content thumbnail thumbnails are static um, the image that gets downloaded is static right so uh, it, they are candidate for storing in the S3 bucket or blob storage, right? So you will get a unique URL for each of the image. But how do you query it? How do you know this URL is belonging to this particular URL and uh, this particular image? And it should show up in the uh, search, right? So it is a big handicap that you cannot query the objects in the image. So we need to find solutions to such problems because practically just storing images or storing data in storage is not may not be enough. You might need to make it searchable, indexed, queryable, things like that. So how do we solve that problem? Okay. Um, so these things are these things are challenging, and uh, uh, when we go further down the course, we will hopefully address these things. But I wanted to make you aware that um, I don't get too many responses when I ask questions. And uh, um, so I don't know how interesting it is sounding to you, but it's my job to tell you. And therefore, I'm telling that any new technology that you're learning, you need to not only learn that technology, but consider the consequences also. Right. So any new concept that you're now learning, like blob storage, you need to understand the consequences of that. Right? You can implement, uh, I know blob storage, we will store the images here, let's go. Down, down the line, request comes that uh, your boss says, no, 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 we need to implement research functionality on the images. You are in a soup because you cannot search uh, the images in the blob storage. So what do you do? Right. So those, th those kind of things you need to be uh, aware of. Okay, moving ahead. Now we have another scenario where we don't want to use uh, the blob storage but uh, basically we want to use the cdn existing cdn network content delivery network to share the static content right and what is the archiving solution so what are cdn we discussed briefly about that they are computing nodes like they are storage nodes that are used to serve uh, that are used to serve the static content right that is pictures and stuff and they are placed at different locations throughout the world and therefore they are like more like caching uh, kind of uh, option so they will detect the requests location and then the server will ask the nodes which is nearest to the uh, request location to serve the content Right. So, using CDN network, you can have log caching, routing, and optimization, routing optimization technique uh, options that are available to you, because you can 
redirect to the node which is nearby. And this CDN was existing before cloud also. But the point is, we can have best of both worlds. We can integrate CDN also in the cloud. Then this is also um, important uh, scenario, right? We discussed, I think I told about this also. Archiving is an important scenario. And what is it? S3 or blob storage is not meant for it. Even though you can store terabytes of data in, in those storages, right? So therefore, we have separate archiving solutions, which, which would basically the prime use case will be that it will cost, it should cost very less. That is the prime use case because archiving solutions are accessed very, very infrequently, rarely, right? So can cloud service providers provide a solution that given that access will not be asked for uh, for long, long time, I want my data to be there, safe, uh, archived, and eventually it should be accessible if I have to access it, right? So, for example, okay, uh, Glacier, AWS Glacier, apparently Glacier freezes the data, right? is an archiving solution that costs much less than S3 bucket. So storage cost is not much, but even that, even lesser than that, we have got AWS Glacier, which is an archiving solution, meaning you can use AWS Glacier service to archive the data. So it will keep taking the data from you, like logs and all, and keep archiving for you and it costs much lesser than S3, right? So where is the difference? Why the cost will be less? Because S3, given a URL of a container where you are archiving your data, you can get instant access to archiving data, archived data, because it's in the container, right? But if you want your uh, access to data in AWS Glacier, it's not going to be like answer to a query that you fired in your software. No, it will take days. It could take weeks also. You need to tell AWS uh, team to provide that data available. Obviously there might be online requests and things like that, but it can take from hours to days to even weeks to get your data. So there will be an SLA for that. Obviously they will meet that SLA, meaning if they say that maximum time it will take to, uh, to get to your data, that you can get your data back or can take a look at your data will be, let's say, X hours. That X hours could be few hundred hours also, right? Uh, but that will be clearly mentioned in the SLA. So it might take a lot of time uh, to get the data, archive data back, but it comes at, uh, comes at a dirt cheap than even s3 for example okay so don't the lesson is do not use s3 or page blobs for archiving data and when you will um, get into the field right these recommendations are just thrown out of the wind because either they don't know about it or they are just doing it because it works right for example i can give you an example uh, in in one project there i was working in uh, this uh, aditya billa group health insurance uh, vertical okay they are so stupid that they are storing their logging information inside of a sql server because nobody is bothered to um, willing to change it even though they know that it is not a, it it impacts the rest of the, the database because um, we are sending logs for every function that it executes no, multiple times within a function we are sending logs and now we are doing this now we are doing that now we are doing this why because on production you cannot directly debug so if there is a production issue somebody uh, using the smartwatch connected to his or her phone uh, running this application. This application is sending the data to its backend and the backend is receiving the data 
logging it that I received this request. This is the data. Then it goes to the next layer. That layer processes that data. It, it logs its own information all into the same SQL Server. And then it runs into terabytes. Imagine it the current subscriber base for that application is around 5 lakh users, half a million users. But they are not they, they are not very well aware of that there is much cheaper solution archiving data. Or you can also, let's say, uh, but the question could be, sir, if we archive the data and there is a customer issue, how do we quickly get the data? You are saying it will take seven days to get the data back. It's a genuine question. So it is not only that you just need to use archiving solution. You can go, you can send the data to first an S3 bucket, okay, or some kind of semi queryable database we will discuss about those things then automatically you can run a scheduler after let's say weeks time or a month's time it will archive pick up the data from that s3 container and archive it so that the size of the container remains small so you don't get to uh, because you're charged for just the space used right so you're Active data is only for a month available to you, and then it goes automatically to your archiving solution. So those kind of uh, solutions is that you need to build. But the point I was trying to tell you is that practically, when it comes to you, when you are working in a company where such a situation comes, then it will come because there are so many dumb people who are working in software. You need to put your foot down that this is the cost that company is incurring because they are storing this um, logs information in SQL Server, S3 bucket, page blog, etc. This is the cost that it will happen for if you store it properly. Show the numbers, let the data talk. Okay, never go for a wrong uh, thing. Always go what is right. Okay, so that is why knowing about archiving solutions is very important. The primary use case is logging, especially from developer's perspective, right? Companies may have option, may have data, uh, what do you say, for archiving or a policy for archiving companies' business data. But most of the time at our levels, uh, we will be archiving the logs. So don't use S3 for logs, at least not uh, for the logs forever, okay? Then Azure CDN is there for Azure based network, like Azure uh, AWS CloudFront is there for uh, uh, serving the static content. Okay. And Azure Blob has an archive tier. So Blob storage that we discussed, they have archiving tier also. Okay. So basically, they say that we will use a blob storage only, but it will be an archive tier. If you pick, if you create a blob storage and choose archiving tier or type of blob as archiving tier, then they that in that blob you can use for archiving the data and it will cost lesser than the other normal blob like this hot and cool tiers. Hot hot tier meaning instant access to the data. Cool tier could be another tier which. Uh, may not give you instant access, but it will give you access. But archiving tier could be three, third one, which is even lesser costly, but gives you data after some time. So you can use these services for both CDN based scenarios and archiving solutions. Okay, AWS CloudFront, AWS Glacier, CDN, Azure CDN and Azure Blob with of of archive tier hello sir yes sir uh, uh, do the cloud providers have any functionality to suggest the user that what you should keep in archive and what you should not keep in archive a oh, very good question um so what we discussed for example this uh, this one the url based storage service what you should do right and uh, these uh, 
architectures we discuss for example our sorry this one these architectures are recommended by azure for example so they do recommend it and uh, um, but many times the recommendation will be at a higher level like this architecture level right um, it could be at lower level also like how to use load balancer for example but many scenarios for example they may not tell you or they may not cover the scenario which i just talked about they make they will cover like this kind of scenarios where there is a uh, how do you come up with a solution which uh, uh, where static intent is served so they might come up with because i have i haven't drawn this figure i have taken it from such um, source somewhere who is recommending this architecture okay but what happens is in generally um, when you deal with it in a real world scenario it is more likely than not that it is it is not covered in a straightforward recommendation architectures so for example this scenario that um, i have logs to store by default we will say store it use a uh, azure blog with archiving tier or use glacier right but once you start using it a customer request comes that i oh my uh, activity is not getting logged through that app i was give talking about the health activity i have taken 10000 steps and it's not giving it because in that app if you cross 10000 steps each day or the day you cross 10,000 steps, those days are considered your coins and you can buy insurance and stuff. So um, the user is seeing that I have taken 10,000 steps. That's what my application or my device is saying. But when I look through the application and it saves the data and fetches back, it says only 8,000 steps. So I immediately log a complaint to the user, uh, to the customer care, and they, they, they send the ticket back to the developers of us. I want to take a look at the logs that what is the user ID and against that user ID when the data came. Now, if I'm using Glacier, uh, it's going to take me like hours to get even the information about what I'm looking for, right? So we need to come up with some kind of a hybrid solution where some data, hopefully 30 days data is good enough for us to uh, query and stuff and handle customer requests. That we put in S3 bucket then we run a solution which takes that S3 bucket every 30 days, every day it runs, but it picks up only last 30 days data, meaning more older than 30 days data and puts it into the uh, glacier. So that kind of architecture or recommendation uh, is not likely to be mentioned or provided by directly by uh, cloud service provider. But having said that, Azure documentation is very detailed. If they might actually deal with such scenarios a lot, a lot of such scenarios are covered, but not everything. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. No issues. Um, okay. One more thing, uh, the storage. When we, when we talk about storage, uh, especially Azure storage, we need to be aware of what are the options available um, in the, as the storage, uh, uh, the storage that you're creating. Uh, when you log in, there is, I remember there was a storage option, but where was it? Um, I think I saw it in the cloud, even in the VM creation time. Just let's see. There was a lot of so where was it? Uh, 
Uh, so probably it was somewhere else. It just I'm not clearly wanting it. I think. It, it, it does uh, ask you that what kind of uh, you want to create mm. uh, in terms of availability, local or geo story. Anyway, we'll talk about that and we'll, we'll cover it. Let's see some example once I have more information. Um, so, what kind of uh, replication or what kind of backup is available? And what are the options available to us so that we can take the right backup decision? Why right redundancy decision? Because why? The cost, right? So cost is everywhere. So you need to be aware of what redundancy you want and what is the corresponding cost for that, right? account top of your Microsoft uh, account and then Azure subscription. You will create a storage account that will be part of under your subscription and then you can create those so when you create a container, it will ask you for what kind of backup or redundancy you need. Okay. Do you need just LRS, locally redundant storage? What does it mean? LRS is the default choice and it is for free. What that means is that when you pick up a storage, the uh, region, whatever region that you are using to store that data in, that you will have to specify when you are creating a, your storage. Automatically in that region, there will be three replicas stored okay of the data so for example if you upload an image there will be three replicas of that image stored within the same region and what else it will can it can provide how can it ensures uh, maximum redundancy what can azure do or if you are in azure in the azure team i told you that you need to store three replicas or three copies of user data by default, right? So for maximum uh, chances of survival in case of failure. So what will you do? Where will you put these three copies? You have racks of machines. Can anybody guess? We have discussed it for as a hint. For maximum storage as a Azure developer guy, where will you, how will you write the software that it uh, copies the data at some place, some hardware location for maximum redundancy? So you are inside the Azure team. You need to implement this LRS. So for maximum redundancy, meaning maximum chance of survival. So what will you do? Where will you put it? Obviously, you will put it in the machine, but how will be the setup? Yeah. Anyway. At three different locations? Hey. Obviously, yes. At three different locations, but can you be more cloud, use more cloud terms? Three different locations, how? We, we are, I am saying it is in the same data center same region so this location is only one so when you say different locations yes but within the region what are what could be those three different locations you're thinking direction is right but you need to use the right terminology normal pleasure for that what is what are three what could be three different locations within the same data center three different fault domains Perfect, yes. So 
you need to use them in three different power domains and for upgrade also three different upgrade domains right so you will put these copies and assign them to three different fault domains and assign them then to three different upgrade domains anyone getting okay so let me ask that question uh, how can i put three things on six places i'm saying that three copies in three different fault domains then three copies in three different upgrade domains so these are like i am trying to distribute three things in six different boxes how will i put it's not possible so why 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 i am saying this and how how i am right or can somebody explain this productive uh, issue and we have discussed this also earlier with diagram with my like lot of explanation Uh, so perhaps we can distribute it in different availability sets. Huh. See, availability set is a feature which is given to the user of the cloud. Right now we are inside of the Azure. So I don't need to worry about availability set. I have direct access to update and upgrade and fault domains where I am putting this information, uh, this user data, right? Now I need to pick, I have list of fault domain 1, fault domain 2, fault domain 3, fault domain 100, about fault domain 1000 because I am a Azure developer. I have access to my SDK that a hardware team has developed, gives me access to all the fault domains available uh, in the data center and all the upgrade domains available in the data center. So my algorithm, meaning the software that is saying when when I send the data, send when the user sends the request, create a storage container, click OK. That request comes to my component. I have implemented that in, in Azure. What I will do, I will get, use that SDK. Give me the available fault domains. It will say 1 to, 1 to 15, 20. These four, four fault domains are available. I'll pick three out of them. Give me the fault update domains available. It, it will give X, Y, Z. Uh, I'll pick three of them. And then I will assign this asset or copy this asset to these three fault domains and three upgrade domains. That is how I have my, as Azure team member, I will implement something like that, right? To serve the request of the user when the user uploads uh, image into its uh, uh, storage code. So my question is, first question was that, where will I store? So different upgrade domains, different fault domains. But I am saying that I am using six things, three fault domains, three upgrade domains to store these three replicas. How? How is it possible? Because there are only three replicas, right? I am not creating six replicas. It has to be three only. But I am saying I will put them three in uh, different fault domains, three in different upgrade domains. That means uh, there should be six replicas. Then how? How it is? How these two things can be explained? Did, did you get my question? The answer is very simple actually. Do you, do you remember what we discussed about upgrade and fault domains? And there was a nice diagram. I thought diagrams help. But apparently they help only if your eyes are open, right? So I don't know if you guys are sleeping or what, but there is that thing. Yeah, here it is. What it is showing? Three fault domains, and where are the upgrade domains here? Why? How we are representing the upgrade domains in this slide? Fault domains is clear. These three boxes. How we are upgrade uh, representing the upgrade domains? By different colors. Yes, different colors, right? So VM1 is one upgrade domain, VM6 is same upgrade domain, VM2 is second upgrade domain, which is matching with VM7. So colors, right? What it means is you can assign 
one fault domain and upgrade name upgrade domain to the same machine at the same time they are orthogonal it's like they are uh, uh, x and y coordinates of a point two properties of the same point x and y so you can think of x being the fault domain y being the upgrade domain and dot being the copy so you can assign two things because they're different uh, dimension they are not in the same line right they are also orthogonal so if vm1 is one image that is coming to me that user uploaded i am assigning it to fault domain zero and blue upgrade domain right like that so i will put three uh, replicas of vm1 as the image one image one image one in three different fault domains and three different upgrade domains. So you are assigning one fault domain and one upgrade domain to same image, same copy, one copy, because there are two X and Y coordinates kind of thing. Okay. I expected you to answer this question. If you are really understanding the cloud computing, what that we are discussing, and if you are really paying attention and revising your course. But apparently, it's not happening. I don't know what to say. I'll do my job properly. That's all I have. You guys should study more. OK. So we solved the issue of how we can have put, uh, obviously, if you see the notes, I think I probably mentioned that. So, locally redundant storage, Azure Storage provides high availability by ensuring three copies of all data are made synchronously before write is deemed successful. Okay, that part I will cover a little more. They are stored in a single facility, right, in a single region, but separate fault and upgrade domains. Okay, this means the data is available even if a storage node holding your data fails or is taking is taken offline to be updated. That's the advantage everybody, I guess, understands about using fault domains and upgrade domains. So now, what is this? Uh, uh, so how do you ensure that the data is readily available or the copies are successful? So you can say, for example, sir, I sent a request. Um, it got copied to one fault domain, one upgrade domain. Okay. Then, for some reason, the software that was running crashed. Okay. Or for some reason, it did not complete it. Now there is a chance. I mean, obviously, it can happen, right? Because there are three. De de uh, there are at least three different tasks. Copy, get the data, copy it to one, two, three pairs of fault domain and upgrade domain, right? So I copy it to one successfully, correct? When I'm doing second, something happens and this crashes, right? So now we have a situation. We have got the data to the user, uh, of the user, right? And because we want to implement asynchronously that we don't want the user to wait we sent when as soon as one copy is made we sent it back to the user saying you're done we have stored your data success but internally we are at a risk we as in azure that if user immediately accesses that data and somehow that fault domain is under maintenance immediately next five minutes user will not find his or her data that you are violating the SLA because I am a user, right? I am obviously paying, then only I am creating, I am able to create the subscription, right? Then only I am able to create the storage account because I am paying for the subscription. If I am paying, I expect you to hold your SLA and you have not held your SLA, I will go to the court and sue you that you lost my data, even if, if it was for one, one hour, right? So how do you tackle how to tackle this situation? So the, situ the answer to that is very simple actually. When the data comes, an image comes, 
the data is copied synchronously it is not a synchronous operation so the image data is coming image data is coming one image data obviously user will send only one image right it comes to me in azure inside of azure i will not send the response of success as success back unless lrs is met three copies to three different fault domains three different upgrade domains is actually fully made then only i send that your data is done right yes it might introduce some latency but you can imagine the kind of infrastructure available parallelism available in azure data centers it will be very very fast very very fast because they will use high capacity fiber optic cables and stuff to process the information faster definitely it cannot be faster than making one copy right it has, you are making three copies one copy uh, but it will inherently be in asynchronous obviously three copies will be done in parallel but the point is that unless those three copies are made you are not sending the request back so for a user it is synchronous on only after three copies are made i do get my response back so it guarantees that lrs always holds okay that is the main important thing to understand the right meaning the right is deemed deemed successful so coming back to our previous failure scenario so we have implement this we sent earlier we sent the uh, response when one copy was made but no now we send it when three copies are made but failure is not tied to copying right failure can happen even if we are trying to make three copies so what if when we are doing copying it is sending uh, failure occurs so how do we what is the next step or how do we handle it so again answer is not very complicated the right is deemed successful only upon three successful copies being made okay otherwise if one copy or two copies are made and we are really failure and we don't have third copy available after some time times out we send the data in response back to the user sorry you have to upload again there is some problem even though we had two copies available so that is the sop standard operating procedure when ensuring lrs because they cannot tell the user that we have got your hold of your data and then not have the state inside of azure that will be breach of trust so at the cost of latency at the cost cost of sophisticated investment of high fiber optics and stuff to make it lesser painful for the user lr is all is always ensured okay so i hope you found it interesting how they do it okay so this is the lrs what is the primary property of lrs what is the prime um, information that user should be aware of that it is lrs it never leaves the boundary of single region single data center right okay so in case of a catastrophic failure for example earthquake destroys the whole region right um, ultimately in a region the power will probably come from let's say one huge cable because you cannot have like three power uh, what you say these power generation powerhouses sending three separate cables to azure data center probably not going to happen okay but let's say even if there are multiple power sources so for some reason it can go down right there could be a large uh, event okay some nuclear explosion is there or some earthquake is there some huge fire is there like uh, um, azure built data center close to forest to save money because their land was cheaper but then fire happens in that forest and it destroys the whole data center so there our fault domain upgrade domains <laughs> won't come into play because the whole thing is destroyed right then the uh, so can you sue 
Azure because they lost your data? Not, not quite. Because if you are opting for LRS, it really means LRS. So if the whole region goes down, okay, if the whole region goes down, um, your data is not going to be available until that region comes back up again. So even then, if whole region is down and some catastrophic event happened, it is not guaranteed that your data will be back. Why? Because you chose only LRS. And LRS guarantees that as long as the region is up, your data is available. But if the region goes down, then it is not guaranteed. Most of the time, so far it has never happened in the cloud history, that the whole region uh, goes down and never comes back up again. So they have their backups and they, they do this maintenance and all. So you don't lose your data, but it might happen. It is not granted that your data is not lost if you are opting for LRS. Okay. So if your data is so critical that you can't even, you know, afford a very small probability of the whole region getting down. Big companies have that kind of requirement. Banks have that kind of requirements. Then the next best option, next option for you is go for GRS, globally or geo redundant storage. Okay. So what GRS means? GRS says that you copy, you send us your data. We will make three copies over here. Now, because you opted for geo or GRS, geo redundant storage, remember, I told you that there is always a paired region in Azure. So that pairing is not our choice. That pairing is done by the uh, Azure itself. So region X and region Y in this case are paired together. Okay. Region X is paired to region Y and vice versa. So once your LRS is complete, you send the request uh, response back that I'm done your data is restored, uh, uh, available or successfully uploaded to the storage, then asynchronously, not synchronously, asynchronously, the data is copied, your image is copied from primary region to its paired region. Okay. And three copies like LRS, on the primary region are also made in the secondary region. This copying is asynchronous and the copy is not available for you to access. Unless, obviously, if something happens to region X, your region X is down, then um, geo failover region failover happens, meaning it uh, transfers the requests that are coming to this region. Remember the traffic manager? That internally Azure will also be using it, right? So once the region X is down, the traffic manager will route all the requests to its paired region Y and fetch the data that it stored for you. Okay? Now, it's an asynchronous copy, and this copy is not available for you. Only when the region goes down shall this come into play. Okay, but what is the advantage then? The advantage is that you can live in peace that region X, even if it goes down, your data is safe. Okay, so if uh, X P is the probability of region X going down, which itself is going to be very small. X P. Uh, sorry, P X, right? Probability of X going down. P Y is probability of region Y going down. What is the probability that both regions X and Y can go down together? Any answers? P X P Y. What is the probability that both region X and Y are going down? Half. 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 
How half? No. What is the answer? Not half. P X into P Y. Yes. P X into P Y. When an event happens, and there is an event of or chance of occurring an event, and there is another event. When event A and event B both happen, what is the probability that gets multiplied? Because probability of two two things happening together is even lesser, right? So because probability is always less than or equal to one, and you multiply it, it reduces further. So 0.5 into 0.5 is 0.25, okay? Because we multiply it two. So half half into two. So you can see that. Uh, the peace of mind that gives GRS gives you is multiply multiplied probabilities of occurrence that one region will go down, and that quantifying that probability is very very small. It's very small. So far, like I said, it hasn't happened so far, but it gives you assurance that it is safe. It is in separate region, and like we said. Pair regions are separate from one another by four, at least 400 kilometers. Okay, so geo redundant GRS gives you additional region where your data is copied, and um, but what is okay? Let us read. It is not available for you to. Uh, use that data. That data is not available for usage. So let's say, what is our geo-redundant storage? So GRS makes three synchronous copies of the data in the primary region for high availability, and then asynchronously, asynchronously makes three replicas in the paired region for disaster recovery. Right? Each region. Each Azure region it has a defined paired paired region, like we discussed, within the same geographic boundary for GRS. Within the same geographic boundary, this is also important. Okay. Why? For example, West US is paired with East US. So, uh, can somebody tell me within the same geographic? Sorry, not geographic. I am not reading properly. Geopolitical boundary. You can read this geopolitical boundary as a general term for a country, right? Or Europe, for example. If the multiple nations, they are very small nations, so they agree to same laws. So multiple, all the all the uh, countries who agree to the same law could be geo, one geopolitical boundary, right? So geopolitical geopolitical boundary. Uh, the paired region has to be within the same geopolitical boundary, right? So that means, for example, West US and East US, they are the paired region. What is the common between two? US, right? It's the same geopolitical boundary. So why I cannot have a data center paired with West US? A, uh, why cannot I have West US data center or region paired against um, French region? Can anybody tell? Obviously, it's not the same. You will say, answer is, sir, it's not same geopolitical boundary. No, that is true. But what could be for why, why it has to be the same geopolitical region? Uh, sir, because there are many rules and regulations which the governments uh, impose on the means on on such companies on cloud providers and all. So based on the broad the broadband uh, the bandwidth available and some things like that. Uh, if if the same is the if the specifications of both the regions are same, then only we can pair them. No, your answer was correct in the first part. Second, that you are talking about bandwidth and uh, this thing that is not the reason. See, technology-wise, it's not a constraint. I technology. If it was only for pure technology, I can very well do pair West US region with France region in the same uh, effort, cost, technology, or um, effort. I mean, the management of it. I can same. 
pair it same with the French region or with the East US region. So the technology or money is not the problem. The problem is, like you said, governing laws. Okay. US would say any data that is in within the geopolitical region of my country cannot leave my country boundary. Okay. Or it might say little more liberal being any data that originates from US soil and is put into the data center that is existing on US soil cannot leave the geopolitical boundary of US. Same could be Europe. Any data that originates from European Union, which is multiple countries within the region, uh, within the European Union geopolitical region cannot leave the European Union geopolitical region. So I can pair a French um, data center with a German data center because they are same geopolitical region boundary. But I cannot pair a German data center with the East US data center because they are different geopolitical regions. Even though it is technically feasible business wise, it might make sense. Some, for example, uh, not example of. Uh, sorry. So the answer. Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, because I am connected with my phone 4G, so and there is a call coming. I hope I thought it might get disrupt my talk to you. Anyways, so uh, what I was saying. Mm, uh, the geopolitical thing, right? So technology wise, it is possible even ah, uh, so what I example I was giving is that if you see a map of USA. So if you see the map, uh, which map, which map, let's say this is easier to follow this. So you can see that's Canada on top of it, right? So if there is some data region, which is in, let's say, in the North Dakota state, and there is a paired region somewhere in the Canada here, right? So business wise, it might make sense to pair these two regions because it is lesser distance travel, lesser cost to network, uh, what do you say, the, uh, optical fiber laying the things right but law minimum law will not allow it right us this is canadian boundary geopolitical region this is us geopolitical region so you have on the left uh, this is your uh, west coast i guess and on the right coast uh, east coast so huge huge territory to cover right between these two states, Montana, Washington, or North Dakota, or Minnesota, uh, Minnesota, these regions could be very close to some Canadian region, but they still cannot. So it makes business sense, but it doesn't allow, it is not allowed by law of the land. Right? So it is very uh, like, interesting that something might make business sense, but it still cannot be doable, right? So you need to be aware of the, not only technology side, but the law side as well, right? So cloud computing, uh, programming, data structures, databases, uh, algorithms, we are just in our cocoon. We are just, okay, this is my um, uh, algorithm. This is my data structure. That is how I use it, right? Nothing changes, no, nothing else other than efficiency of the algorithm and stuff. They are all technical things. But in cloud, there are two other dimensions that you need to always consider. One is cost, I told you, right? Second is this. Is there any law that is inadvertently getting violated when you are implementing some solution, right? So, for example, you could write a very intelligent algorithm saying, sir, I have written this algorithm. I will calculate, it will automatically calculate the costs of different regions in the available area 
and it will send the data only to that region. But that is a fundamentally flawed algorithm because how do you know it does not cross a geopolitical region boundary, right? So you have to take that into account. So these are the new factors that are not common in our thinking. That's why I emphasize again and again. You have to develop a habit of thinking in a way where it, it takes into account the cost and such geopolitical or some region uh, laws or uh, legal things into consideration. It may not happen, but you, when you present your design, when you make your slides, you do have a point of cost or a bullet that is saying cost, a bullet that is saying legal, geopolitical, these kind of issues. Definitely, definitely should have it in addition to the technology bullet that you will have. That is a new thing. You should definitely, definitely incur that, uh, inculcate that in your mind. Okay. All right. So another important point is GRS copies in the region that is not the copies that you are, the copies that are, are getting copied made in the uh, paired region are not accessible to us. Okay. So that means it is a best viewed as a disaster recovery for Microsoft rather than for you. You opt for it, right? But Microsoft manages all those things. Like what, what means copying it is managing that we already discussed. Making it available when the region X goes down, that is also Microsoft's responsibility. It's more like a disaster recovery solution that Microsoft implements for any customers who are just ticking on checkbox saying, I want GRS. But they, that data is not available for you. Okay. In the event of a major failure in primary region, sorry, it all went. Primary region, Microsoft would make the GRS replicas available, but this has never happened to date. So, so far it hasn't happened, but Microsoft will available make available the GRS replicas to you. Okay. Now, we covered uh, LRS and GRS. So one, there is one RAGRS, read access geo storage. So apparently it would have started from LRS only, right? First in the stage one, when Azure was new, LRS will be available. Then stage two, they implemented internal GRS, right? And exposed it as a feature. Stage three, now, these three copies lying over here are probably never going to be used, right? So why should I not use them when I have them, right? So then comes the feature. They enabled RAGO GRS, read access to your storage. <coughs> GRS uh, is not available to view, but next logical question is boss, I you already have the data, right? I get 90% of my requests as read-only requests because people are viewing my information. Now I want to split that, or maybe let's let's uh, 80% is let's say 40%, 60%. 40% is read uh, write requests, 60% percent are read requests. So while my server is busy serving those 40% requests on the primary region where my website is also deployed. My question as a user to Microsoft is, but is you are putting three, uh, the same information in the paired region, why can't I redirect my 60% request to read the data to your secondary region? It will free up my web server over the secondary uh, primary region so that it can happily write the data, right? So after some time, Microsoft will come back Buddy, we have implemented what you asked us. You can enable or opt for read access GRS option. Then the data available in your paid region is also accessible to you for read only access. So any read only request I can send over here. Okay. Any read only request I can send over here. And you will have access to 
the data. So that is our read access geo redundant storage. Okay. Now I have another question for you. The question that you should ask me, I am trying to ask myself. So the question is, sir, you said um, that RA access is available here now. Let's see if my digital pen works. So here is my traffic manager. It is sending the request to uh, read only request here. Read write access summary read and mostly write access is here. And here is my client, right? Looking at the computer. Come on. The pen stops. So now this is the computer, right? Um, let's say this guy is a my e-commerce worker. So it uploads, or not even worker, this is a seller. Okay, so it uploads, updates the price of its proper, uh, what do you say, item. So from 100 rupees, it updates it to 120 rupees. Okay, so this, this is all 100 over here, right? So the request comes from, for, for 120, it comes through the traffic manager to here because it's the right update, right? So this 100 becomes 120, right? Now, in, uh, the copy from here to here is asynchronous, right? Async copy. That means here it is still 100, not yet happened, right? Copy has not yet happened. Immediately or at the same time, some guy is a customer or buyer is sending request of the same item, let's say I. Item I, give me the price of item I. So the traffic manager is seeing that it is a read-only request, it sends the request here, it reads the data, sends the answer back, 100. So there is a data inconsistency. Buyer places order, 100 rupees, right? Seller is expecting 120 rupees. And because of this nonsense that Microsoft implemented, there is a hangama here between buyer and seller. So how do you answer that question? That uh, you can give me, you give me read-only access, but the, this scenario is breaking this. I mean, customer, seller is expecting 120 rupees. It's a data inconsistency issue. Buyer is paying 100 rupees and seller is expecting 120 rupees. So how do you how do you how do you ensure this? How this is like uh, uh, how this any how is it possible or how this is a plausible scenario that this could be this RAGRS could be useful for anybody? Can anybody answer that question or think about it or share his or her opinion? Like what could be the possible we do uh, or how still we can because this can happen right how we can still uh, apparently RAGRS is there right so it means it is still getting used so how we can justify this in the, given the scenario I described anyone okay so we will talk about something called eventual consistency okay there are many scenarios where this sorry this 120 versus 100 is actually acceptable okay many scenarios so i'll just give you uh, within this context and then we will talk about it later in more detail. Why I'm saying so. So for example, this user that the buyer that was paying 100 rupees price, right? 
and the seller that was handing at, selling at 120 rupees how to reconcile so what can happen is this 100 rupees price is being shown all the time when uh, sorry all the time when i am looking at the item right when i am placing the order finally when i am placing the order this application who this seller is uh, deploying this application right so this app has code that is running which is taking the request it will ensure that there is only single source of truth let's say this this database is single source of truth so when the order when it comes to placing the order the application will fetch the data from here first and then send it back so when order gets order page gets displayed it will show 120 because that application is uh, ensuring that it reads finally the the latest price so obviously buyer will get spooked a little bit that from 100 became 120 obviously uh, that might happen right we can say some message over here that the item got updated things like that and it could be actually 80 rupees also it's just a price update and we are used to seeing this sometimes when we are booking tickets the price changes when we are actually at the order stage right so the point is uh, how many times the user views the information or when i am on on amazon or flipkart how many times i view it view the items and how many how many times out of those i place actual order it will be like 90 10 percent kind of thing right so 90 percent of the time even though there is a difference of price the ultimate inconsistency that we were talking about that the buyer was uh, buyer is willing to send spend 100 rupees and a seller is expecting 120 and then it becomes a hangama is not going to happen because ultimately buyer will have to shell out 120 rupees and know that the price was jacked up to 120 in some time while he or she was viewing it right but that is only for this 10 percent cases for 90 percent of the case all i am looking for is the item is what is the item who is the seller what is the warranty what is the colors option sizes and stuff right those scenarios will continue to work so the answer to the data inconsistency is not that data is consistency is inconsistency is not there it is there but it may not be applicable for many many of the scenarios and this is uh, useful in many many other scenarios right the, those 90 percent of scenarios it is useful so that is the answer short answer to the question we will deal with this uh, in much much more detail because that's this concept of eventual consistency is new to us uh, because all we know in our sql databases is consistency model right atomic interactions so it's a very interesting new world anyway so we have finally uh, justified the usage use scenario use case scenario of read only access even though there could be data consistency issues okay so we have got lrs grs ragrs so let's read about ragrs what what uh, uh, my notes say read access geo redundant storage is the ability to read the data in the secondary region that's the ability right basically uh, the disaster recovery solution is made available to the user right in the primary region we can change your application to have read only access to the peer region so uh, you can use this namespace in your code storage retype proxy location mode to change it to secondary and if uh, if it is a read only request right so you can basically spread out the performance right you have now two regions in parallel you can uh, use to increase the performance or reduce your cpu cycles and save some cost okay and then finally zone redundant storage this is a new option that has come this can be used only for block blobs, blobs in the standard storage account. It basically replicates 
uh, data to uh, two to three facilities, either within the region or across two regions. So it's basically, uh, it is a no cost, uh, I think we should check that, locally redundant storage with more um, copies between the two regions also. So this is like latest option they have implemented. So you should check it out more detail. Like what is the cost and uh, what is the cost for this zone redundant storage? It basically ensures that either within the region, they have two data centers. So they will be copying it across to those two facilities, right? Or it could even go to multiple regions. So check this uh, zone redundant storage. What are the details of this, right? Okay, so I guess this was uh, uh, interesting to you and we will continue further. Do you have any questions? All right, have a good day then. Bye.